Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, do Grand Rounds. Uh, it's a truly an honor. Um, and today's topic uh, is going to be on screening for dementia. So we'll talk, uh, give an overview of dementia with we'll focus, uh, focus on Alzheimer's and uh, some rules of thumb for differential diagnosis of dementia. Uh, next, we'll talk about Alzheimer's versus mild cognitive impairment. Uh, we'll ask why should we screen for dementia, and finally, uh, talk about what we should, what we can screen with. So, dementia is a growing problem, particularly as the population ages, and uh, you can see the graph here that the number of cases is projected to double every uh, 20 years or so. So. It's a common and growing problem. Uh, the definition of dementia is a decline in cognitive function sufficient to interfere with daily activities or occupational function. So dementia is more of a syndrome than a diagnosis. There are many different causes of dementia. That's one of the most frequent questions I get asked by patients is, what's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? And tell them, well, dementia is the general term, there are many different causes, and Alzheimer's is one of the most common. Um, so there are primary dementias, uh, Alzheimer's, Lewy body dementia, frontal temporal dementia, normal pressure hydrocephalus. There can be dementias associated with other neurological diseases, Parkinson's patients develop dementia as do Huntington's and MS patients, they get far enough along, can also uh, become demented. Uh, there's a number of medical illnesses that uh, can predispose or cause dementia. Toxins and meds are an important uh, cause. Um, there's so-called uh, pseudo-dementia or uh, severe patients with severe depression. It's important to distinguish. There's vascular dementia, which can be either due to multiple small strokes or a uh, few large strokes. And probably in, in the like 70s and 80s, um, certainly the 80s, the most common cause of dementia is actually a mixed uh, Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. Uh, it's important to be aware that, of course, neoplasms can cause a dementia, glioblastomas, and so forth. There's a number of infectious etiologies, HIV, Jakob Kreutzfeld, neurosyphilis. I had a case of that recently. It's pretty rare these days. Uh, and uh, nutrition, um, chronic alcoholism is something to consider there. So the standard dementia workup you're all familiar with, CBC, chem panel, B12, thyroid, maybe check for inflammatory markers. Um, EEG is kind of optional usually unless we really think the patient's having seizures. Uh, a few screening uh, uh, infectious disease labs, an MRI of the brain to exclude certain reversible uh, causes. Biomarkers, we'll talk about that more in a minute, uh, I think are going to become critically important. Um, that said, though, the estimate of reversible dementias is um, very small. But the most important workup is a careful review of medications, uh, alcohol, and substance abuse history. I, I, my experience, I've been amazed sometimes. You know, talking with a guy who seems like a very standing citizen and straight cheer, but he asked him how much they drink and, you know, they're downing several highballs a night and have been for years. And <clears throat> they, if they can stop drinking, that might, you know, that can play a definite role in reversing their memory problems. It's very important to get um, feedback from uh, an informant uh, usually the wife or uh, son or daughter, uh, on their perspective of the patient's functioning. Uh, 
you should inquire about educational occupational history so you get some idea about the patient's background. And uh, a sleep history. Uh, some patients with memory complaints uh, can be related to obstructive sleep apnea, which is a reversible cause. Plus, there's increasing evidence that uh, sleep apnea is actually a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there's something called the lymphatic system, which clears uh, amyloid and is active during sleep. And um, that's impaired in people that aren't getting a good night's sleep. So <clears throat> quickly, here's some rules of thumb in the differential diagnosis of common dementia syndromes. So for Alzheimer's, you have a typical story of gradually progressive history of memory loss. There's fairly minimal vascular disease on MRIs. On the other hand, if you have a stepwise history, multiple vascular risk factor, and the MRI shows strokes, then you think of vascular dementia. Um, if you if patient is, you know, again up in their 80s or so and they have strokes on MRI, but they're they're kind of a gradually progressive history, then probably you're looking at a mixed Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. On the other hand, if uh, the patient is relatively younger and has prominent behavioral problems, then think of behavioral variant from a temporal dementia. Uh, if they have a prominent gait disturbance in ventricular megaly, obviously you'll think NPH, normal pressure hydrocephalus. And if they have concurrent Parkinsonism, uh, visual hallucinations, and uh, marked day-to-day -day fluctuations, that's the hallmark for diffuse Lewy body dementia. Okay, so a little bit about uh, basics of Alzheimer's pathogenesis. So it all starts here with the amyloid precursor protein. Um, which has a carboxy terminus in the cytoplasm and a neon terminus in the lumen. And the key action here um, is taking place uh, in the transmembrane portion, primarily, or right near the transmembrane portion. Um, APP is a uh, very evolutionarily conserved protein, and uh, scientists have been working for some time on trying to define exactly what it does. It's involved in uh, embryogenesis and synaptogenesis and functions in the peripheral nervous system. And so um, it, it does quite a bit. Uh, now, it's processed by uh, a variety of enzymes. Um, and uh, so here's the amino acid sequence of the protein. Here's the, you know, transmembrane right outside of it. And there's different cleavage sites for uh, different enzymes. And this is very important because there's a non-amyloidogenic pathway for cleavage and an amyloidogenic pathway. So for the non-amyloidogenic pathway, First, the APP gets cleaved by alpha secretase and then gamma secretase. And the fragments it produces are um, harmless. On the other hand, if the protein is first cleaved by beta secretase and then gamma secretase, that's when you get release of this A beta 42 or A beta 40 uh, fragment uh, that is. Uh, uh, they glom together and form the uh, pathologic hallmark of Alzheimer's, which is the uh, uh, plaque. Um, the other pathologic hallmark tends to develop later in Alzheimer's, the neurofibrillary tangle, uh, which is intracellular, whereas the plaque is extracellular. And the NFT is related to tau pathology. So Alzheimer's progression, uh, in the first stage, you just have the A-beta plaque pathology. 
Um, but you have biomarkers like a positive amyloid PET scan uh, or low cerebral spinal fluid A beta 42 levels. The reason why it's low is because it gets sequestered in the uh, extracellular flax and doesn't circulate in the spinal fluid. That's a little bit counterintuitive. Um, tau, on the other hand, in the second stage, uh, CSF tau becomes elevated. Um, <clears throat> and here's where you start to get uh, things like brain atrophy on an MRI scan. And um, uh, you can also see uh, abnormalities of metabolism on FTG PET. In the third stage, uh, you have biomarkers plus subtle cognitive decline. So you start to see um, uh, problems. Uh, very first clinical symptoms are only in the later stages, actually, as it were, uh, that then lead to uh, more overt mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. So. There's the amyloid hypothesis of Alzheimer's, which has held sway for decades now. And some of the evidence for that is includes uh, that genetic uh, mutations in uh, the APP protein or also presenol 1 and 2, which are involved in uh, amyloid processing, uh, cause uh, a, a familiar, a familial uh, Alzheimer's disease. Trisomy 21 Down syndrome, uh, APP is on trisomy 20, uh, is on the chromosome 21, so you have an extra dose of it. Um, <clears throat> uh, and there's also evidence that the A beta pathology can occur decades before you get any clinical manifestations. There may also be interactions between um, amyloid formation and subsequent tau formation. So the graph here shows that, the, again, the first thing that happens is amyloid accumulation. Uh, that's followed by synaptic dysfunction and then tau mediated and then coronal injury. Then you start getting brain um, structural uh, uh, damage that's visible on uh, MRI scans in the form of atrophy. And then finally you start getting cognitive aspect, a little bit of cognitive decline, and then it becomes more overtly uh, visible. So biomarkers. Um, so there's the floor beta peer uh, or amyvid scan. This is a ligand that binds specifically to amyloid plaque. And so uh, here we have people at different stages of amyloid pathology. Um, if you have mild cognitive impairment and a positive amyloid scan, your chances of progressing into Alzheimer's disease are sevenfold higher than if you have a negative Scan. Uh, one problem with it is that you can have false positives in cognitively normal elderly. But on the other hand, it could be that these people are actually on their way to Alzheimer's. Uh, or perhaps there's something about their biology that's resistant to amyloid. So, great question. No. Two big problems with amyloid scans. They're usually not covered by insurance and they're very expensive. There are other Alzheimer's biomarkers. Uh, hippocampal atrophy, there's a, a program called NeuroQuant that uh, can define the hippocampal volume. So if you have a low volume on a NeuroQuant analysis that uh, is consistent with Alzheimer's. CSF uh, amyloid tau, uh, we mentioned uh, earlier. Um, the APOE4 gene, so APOE4 uh, is the major kind of risk factor, a genetic risk factor in the population for Alzheimer's, but you can't, 
you know, you can have E4 not have Alzheimer's. And conversely, you can have only E3 and still have Alzheimer's. But, but if you have an E4 allele and you have some memory symptoms, the odds are that does increase the chances significantly that um, the cause of your memory problem is really Alzheimer's. Uh, other AD biomarkers, we mentioned temporal parietal hypermetabolism on FDG PET scans. Blood tests, uh, we're really looking forward to those, and there are some under development, um, particularly uh, phosphorylated tau uh, proteins or the A beta 42 ratios. Um, they're not quite ready yet for prime time, they're not reimbursable. Uh, but I, my feeling is in the next year or two, we're, we're going to have them. And that will be very helpful. So you've probably all heard in the news about aducanumab, drug made by Biogen. Uh, will it be a game changer? So aducanumab is a monoclonal antibody that binds and clears amyloid plaque. There's zero doubt that it does that. And it's, it's very clear that it, it's effective in getting rid of amyloid plaque. The controversy is over the clinical effect. And there's a long saga of what happened with it. So the initial trials were halted by Biogen after a futility analysis. But then after they reanalyzed the data, they found that patients with mild cognitive impairment and mild Alzheimer's did show some clinical benefit. And more evidence is accumulating, for example, there's further extension data. That after two years, the patients who had a decrease in PTAL 181, uh, this is a blood biomarker, had better outcomes on clinical measures. More trials are planned. Uh, Lilly has a, their own drug, Dynamimab, which uh, works somewhat similarly. Uh, and their trials are in progress and have shown some know, uh, positive results. Downsides are that it's really expensive. It started out at 56K a year, and Biogen cut it to 28. Um, and uh, the risk of something called ARIA, amyloid-related imaging abnormalities, these are uh, like inflammatory changes that occur and are visible on MRI. Many times it's asymptomatic, but uh, it can cause confusion and headaches, and you have to halt the drug if that, uh, if that occurs. Although they do have evidence that later on, when it calms down, you can restart it. But the risk of area means that you have to do routine MRI monitoring, um, as well as MRI scans if you suspect that uh, there's clinical effects of an area going on. Now, CMS recently ruled that in order to be reimbursed, uh, in order for aducanumab to be reimbursed, and you have to be involved in a clinical trial that meets their criteria. And right now, that, that's not going on. They're, I think the trials are in the process of getting uh, formulated. But on a practical level, at the moment, um, given that most, you know, Alzheimer patients have Medicare insurance, uh, without participation in a clinical trial, you're not going to get reimbursed. Uh, okay, next topic is Alzheimer's versus mild cognitive impairment. So again, the natural history of Alzheimer's start out normal, then you start to decline a bit, hit the MCI stage, and mild Alzheimer's and severe Alzheimer's. So mild cognitive impairment, or if you have a positive biomarker, you can call it prodromal Alzheimer's disease. It's a kind of a fuzzy boundary between normal aging and dementia. Um, on the one hand, the cutoff to a normal person means that your memory or other cognitive domains are not normal. 
which is technically defined as one and a half standard deviations below the mean on some cognitive tests. Uh, and then to distinguish to from dementia, there's no significant occupational or functional impairment. Now, this is a bit of a fuzzy boundary. One person's MCI can be another person's dementia. Take two people who have identical cognitive function. Okay, and one of them is a high-powered corporate attorney. Well, it may not take all that much loss of memory for him not to be able to function in his job. So he has to take disability retirement. So he's in the Alzheimer's range. On the other hand, the other guy with the same degree of cognitive impairment Okay, so he doesn't remember the football scores from the weekend before. It's no big deal. He's MCI. Um, the older Alzheimer drugs like clonestrase inhibitors have not been shown to work in MCI. Uh, but stay tuned. I'll have a little bit more to say about that in a minute. So distinguishing normal from uh, mild cognitive impairment is sometimes an art. There's kind of two clinical situations. One is both the worried well, these are older people who have noticed some senior moments and they're worried, oh God, am I getting Alzheimer's disease? Uh, but they don't really have it. And the second uh, situation are patients that don't have any complaints themselves, but you do a screening cognitive test and they have trouble with it. So using, you know, various cognitive tests, the mini mental, the MOCA, and I have my own test, which I'll introduce you to later, um, can help with the assessment. I mean, anybody who's got a mini mental of 19, you know, they're going to be in the dementia range, not MCI. Um, however, particularly people with intermediate sorts of scores, you have to factor in the effect of drugs, medical illnesses, stressors, educational, occupational background. So sometimes it's hard to tell and you may just have to follow the patient over time. Uh, some helpful tools in determining crossover from MCI to dementia. Uh, there are caregiver assessment tools, which I'll show you in a sec. Um, and uh, uh, asking the caregiver this question, would you feel safe leaving the patient home alone for you? They say no, that's intuitively that they feel that uh, they don't think the patient is cognitively well enough to be able to manage on their own. Uh, and the degree of deficits on the mental status exam, like how bad are they on mini mental or broken. Uh, but it's a continuum rather than a bright line. So I'll tell you about the functional activities questionnaire. This is, uh, again, the caregiver filling it out. It's a zero to three scale of 10 items covering handling finances, shopping alone, playing a game of skill, keeping track of current events, remembering appointments, traveling out of the neighborhood, and uh, so forth. So this is what it looks like. And uh, by the way, um, if any of you are interested in getting um, your, you know, copies of these uh, questionnaires or um, screening tests that I'll describe later, feel free to email me and uh, I can uh, send them to you. So again, uh, uh, the uh, caregiver fills out um, the zero to three scale, these uh, various activities. You have a score of uh, ranging from zero, no problem, to three, completely unable to uh, another helpful item for your history is the AD8, Alzheimer's Disease 8, informant questionnaire. Here, the caregiver fills out yes or no if there's been a change in the eight items, such as repeating questions, stories, or statements, forgetting the correct month or year, uh, and so forth. So there's some overlap with the FAQ, but there's also some earlier things that uh, it handles that are sensitive to MCI and dementia. And here's what it looks like. Patient, the caregiver just checks yes or no for these uh, eight uh, different items. And if you have a score of greater than two, 
has a sensitivity of 74% and specificity of 85% for a dementia diagnosis. So this can help uh, kind of round out your history here. These uh, different uh, problems that the patient may have. Uh, another uh, questionnaire that I like to use is the Neuropsychiatric Inventory Short Form. Uh, this is a two-page form. It gets at neurobehavioral symptoms. Uh, these tend to become more prominent, mainly in the moderate dementia stages. Uh, but the caregiver rates uh, for each of these things, like delusions, hallucinations, agitation, and so forth, depression, anxiety, uh, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe, and how much distress it causes the caregiver. Anywhere from zero doesn't bother them at all to five is very distressing. Uh, caregiver stress, that's a, actually a major problem in Alzheimer's patients. The patients may be sort of blissfully unaware that they have problems, but the caregiver certainly isn't. And uh, here's the second page of the MPI short form. So what happens to MCI patients? So the conversion rate to Alzheimer's disease varies among studies. Usually, uh, most of them peg it at around 10 to 20% per year. Uh, again, if you have a positive biomarker that, you know, indicate you're, you're more likely to go. Uh, but on the other hand, some MCI patients can remain stable for many years. A uh, small percentage could even revert back to normal and then progress again later. Uh, the factors that predict or prevent conversion are under active investigation, are under active investigation, clinical things we'll talk about in a minute, like exercise and so on, uh, as well as uh, biomarkers. The American Academy of Neurology recommends MCI patients be monitored at intervals for evidence of cognitive decline. Okay, why should we screen for dementia is the next topic. So Alzheimer's disease is often misdiagnosed. Um, they're often diagnosed with some other cause of dementia uh, or uh, depression, maybe, or it's just normal aging, stroke, et cetera. So um, only 28% of patients that had Alzheimer's were initially diagnosed with it. And uh, dementia is, in patients over 65 in primary care practices, is estimated to be around 10% or so, but of these, it's estimated that around half are not actually diagnosed. So who do they fool? Well, they fool themselves often. There's a phenomenon called anosognosia, where patients are not aware that they have a problem. So if you ask an older person, um, hey, you know, have you noticed any memory problems? As you've been getting older, and they say no, haven't. Well, that may be true, and they in fact are normal, or it can actually be a manifestation of the disease. They do have memory problems, but uh, they don't have the insight to recognize that that's the case. So they can fool themselves, uh, they can fool the family uh, as well. Um, Give some reasons why that's the case in a minute, and they can fool you. So, how do they get away with it? Well, social skills are often preserved early on in Alzheimer's. So, a patient with really mild uh, symptoms, talking to them in your clinical encounter, you really may not pick up that you know this person has a problem. Um, and uh, also, uh, Alzheimer's, you know, insidious onset, so uh, excuses can be made for gradual loss of function, uh, such as it's just age. Uh, I mentioned earlier that, you know, retirees may not be stressed intellectually, so nobody notices their uh, subtle cognitive decline. And from the family's perspective, uh, they may 
dismiss it and say, Grandma's fine. You know, she still recognizes the family after all. But again, of course, it's short-term memory that's affected early on in dementia. Uh, or denial. Uh, his memory can't be all that bad. He can remember all about his high school graduation. Uh, and on our part, uh, you may not ask routinely about memory complaints, may not test for it, to gloss over it, or blame it on depression. Uh, Okay, so why should we screen for dementia? Diagnosis in an earlier stage allows for better planning, such as financial planning, giving power of attorney and so forth. Uh, driving risk, we'll talk about in a sec, um, can be a post-operative delirium risk factor and uh, uh, medication compliance. We'll go over this in, in a minute and as the diagnosis of early dementia is often missed unless we use screening tools. Uh, if you do a screening test and it's negative, that can be a positive thing because A, it establishes a baseline. In my practice, it's been very helpful if I've seen a patient a few years before for some other reason uh, and I did a, a, you know, a screening test and they did okay. They come back in two or three years saying, you know, my memory's starting to go, I think, then, um, you know, repeating the test, you can compare it directly. Um, and if it's negative, you can provide the patient with reassurance that, you know, right now everything seems to be okay. Keep an eye on it. Uh, sometimes doctors will just prescribe the nepozo if the patient has a complaint and that their memory is going and not you know, establish a firm diagnosis that there is a problem. Uh, earlier treatment, even with the older drugs, may be more beneficial than later treatment. This is a, somewhat of a controversial statement, but uh, there's some Scandinavian studies recently that indicate that patients that are started on cholinesterase inhibitors early on tend to have less like nursing home placement and uh, mortality than patients that are started later. And another reason is it's now part of Medicare requirements for patients that you do some kind of screening. Uh, so post-operative delirium. Um, so uh, Esther O over at Hopkins uh, did a review of hip fracture patients and concluded that preoperative cognitive impairment is the thing that's most consistently associated with post-operative delirium. And the American Geriatric Society has clinical guidelines for delirium prevention and treatment. But I don't think anybody's really done a study yet of implementing routine dementia screening uh, for surgeons who are planning on doing hip fracture repair and then taking action to prevent delirium, then do the patients actually have a low risk of delirium? So that would be a really good study to do, but um, certainly if a patient has screens, you know, that they have significant cognitive impairment, uh, that uh, should alert you that if they do get some kind of elective surgery and anesthesia, they could have problems afterwards. Uh, driving, so the risk of crashes increases with Alzheimer's. Um, Patients, definitely, if they're in moderate to severe dementia, should not drive at all. Mild patients, um, I usually recommend that they get a driving safety evaluation via OT or the Motor Vehicle Association. Uh, there are certain programs like Sinai and uh, Good Samaritan that have uh, occupational therapy uh, driving evals. Uh, if they flunk, then their license gets pulled. And that can be a major, you know, kind of problem with these patients that they're not happy about the loss of independence with driving. On the one hand, but it's better than getting into, or, you know, a, a crash. So this old lady is trying to order a cheeseburger and large fries from the mailbox here. Spectators are commenting that 
testing seniors for driving is a bad idea. Medication compliance. So uh, here's a quote in clinical practice awareness of non adherence as a result of cognitive impairment is relatively low. The most important step is really detection of cognitive impairment. So if you have a patient with cognitive impairment, you don't realize it, you may be upping their medications, not because they're not working, but uh, because the patients are not taking them consistently. So uh, patients that have some cognitive decline, they may need additional oversight from the family. Uh, early versus later intervention. So I mentioned uh, the Alzheimer's drugs that we have, you know, presently that are widely available, uh, can offer symptomatic benefit at least. Um, and then there's a variety of lifestyle things like exercise and cognition. Um, the more you exercise, the, the less likely it is that you become demented. There's a lot of evidence for that. Uh, staying cognitively active, socially active, dietary factors, a heart healthy diet, uh, diets that are rich in flavonoids may have protective function. So there have been some clinical trials where you take patients with MCI and you have them, you know, under uh, start an exercise routine and uh, you know intervene dietarily and et cetera. Um, and some of them have had a positive result, um, although others have not. So that's still kind of getting fleshed out. Okay, finally, we come to what to screen with. So uh, there's a variety of dementia screening tests, as you sure we know. Uh, we'll talk about the mini mental, the MOCA, something called the memory impairment screen, a clock draw, the mini cod, the Hopkins verbal learning test, the slums test, and finally, my own test, QE or quick and easy. So here's the good old MMSE. You guys are all familiar with it, I'm sure. Uh, I point out, and I'll mention this again later, that the things that are most sensitive on this test for dementia are the three item recall and uh, the date. Um, that shows up early on. On the other hand, things like naming a pen or a watch, you don't lose that through your pretty far gone. So it has items that are sensitive to both mild and moderate or severe dementia. So it's useful for following patients throughout the course. And there is evidence that, um, you know, the worse off your MMSE is, the more likely it is that you uh, lose um, these uh, activities of daily living abilities. Uh, with the more severe mini metals being associated with more uh, easier ADLs, like being able to clear the table or, versus uh, traveling alone. Problems with the mini metal. Well, it's not really sensitive for milder intelligent patients. On the, on the one hand, on the other hand, it's not specific for patients with low education or IQ. Uh, there's some scoring issues with it, like some mini metals, uh, you have the serial sevens versus the world backwards, which one to use. Uh, I practice in Baltimore City, so there is no such thing as asking what county are you in? It's a trick question, really. Uh, it takes a little while to administer. It's now copyrighted, so if you're gonna publish anything with it, you're supposed to get permission from the people that own the copyright. Although I've, I've yet to be busted by the mini metal state police. Uh, on the other hand, it's still useful for staging and communication. Everybody understands, you know, roughly what a mini metal state score of 17 means versus 26. Now the MOCA. <clears throat> is more difficult than the mini metal. Uh, you should keep in mind it was normed on smart Canadians with an average of one year of college education. 
and cut scores are much lower in other populations. Um, and uh, in particular, in the demographic of Baltimore City, where you have patients that have a lot of demographic challenges with education and so forth, um, it's using the cut score of uh, 27 or 26 just uh, is too nonspecific. What I find it particularly useful, though, for is for people, you know, really smart older people that have mild deficits. It does take 10 to 15 minutes to administer. And uh, so here's the test. Uh, it has a five item recall separated by a number of other things, including the serial sevens, which is educationally sensitive. Um, Uh, the memory impairment screen. So this is a four item semantically encoded uh, items that the patient has to remember. I'll show you what that means in a sec. So they read aloud four words from different categories. Then they're given the cue and asked to match the word. And then you ask them, okay, what were the words I showed you on a piece of paper two minutes ago? And the scoring is two points for each uh, one they recall spontaneously, one point for the Q, zero if they don't get it even with the Q. So it says zero to eight scale, less than four is dementia, five to six is borderline, seven to eight is normal. So I use, for example, United Nations platter chests and emails. The patient reads them and then you say, okay, which one of those is a dish platter? Which one's a message, email, organization, UN, a game, chess. So uh, the semantic encoding helps with um, uh, specificity. So the MIS and the Einstein aging study compared to a straightforward three item recall did have higher sensitivity and uh, specificity for detecting uh, dementia. Clock draw test. Uh, so ask the patient to draw a clock, set the hands at 10 past 11. But, I mean, various scoring systems have been proposed. In practice, I really don't think people follow these different scoring system, particularly. It's mainly a gestalt if it's normal or abnormal. It's not very sensitive and really mild patients. It is part of the mini cog, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, it's worth three points on the MOCA. So the mini cog is a three item recall with a clock draw in between. So that was just something called the six item screener, which is the day of the week date and, um, I'm sorry, day of the week, month and year uh, with a three item, uh, you know, that's in between learning and remembering the three items. Uh, the mo mini cog is basically pass fail, but it is judged to be one of the best fast screens. Uh, although it, it does rely on this three item recall, and because it's mainly past failure, you can't really use it to follow the progress of the patient. Uh, next up is the Hopkins Verbal Learning Test, which I really like. This is a test um, that was developed by Jason Brandt over at Hopkins some years ago. Um, and uh, it's a list of 12 words. Uh, uh, and uh, there's four, uh, for them in three different categories. So in this instance, it's uh, animals, uh, jewels, and uh, shelters. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so you read the list and the patient repeats back as many as they can. You go through it three times. And so the initial recall score is the sum of how many they remember on each of the trials. Um, and then uh, there's a discrimination index, which is uh, a patient just says yes or no if the items are on the list or on that list. Uh, and you go through the 24 words here, uh, 12 of which, of course, are on the list, and uh, 12 of which are not, six of them being in the same category, like ruby is a jewel and a cat is an animal. Um, <clears throat> And you take the number of correct versus and subtract the number incorrect to get the discrimination index. And you add that to the recall score, you get a total score. 
total memory score. And under 24 is suggested with Alzheimer's and CI borderline. And this is uh, under 28. It's 28 and under. Uh, a very handy, very sensitive is to do a 10 minute recall. So you come back and surprise the patient, like after doing their rest of their exam or something, 10 minutes later, say, okay, what were the words on that screening on that long word list that we did a little while ago? And they should be able, normal is seven or up, and uh, six or below indicates there's a problem. This 10 minute recall is. Uh, pretty sensitive to memory problems. Uh, the SLUMS test, St. Louis University, uh, Mill State, uh, was developed for veterans, but subsequently validated in other populations. It tests uh, orientation. Uh, we call with both a five item uh, list here, and also there's a story that's told, and then we'll ask uh, several questions of, about the story. It's been shown to be better than the mini metal at detecting MCI. Like the mini metal, it's a 30 point scale, 27 and up is considered normal. The last few minutes, I'll tell you about my Q and E test, quick and easy. It takes 95 seconds in the normal adult. So, one of the major uh, impediments to busy primary care docs doing dementia screening tests is time. This is one of the fastest you know, tests you can do. Um, I, there's actually two parts to it. We're only going to be talking about the Q&E part. So rationale for it. So what's the single most sensitive test for Alzheimer's? It's delayed recall after initial encoding. Uh, other good tests for Alzheimer's are semantic fluency, animals and many. You can use that actually as a standalone test. Uh, but it is a little bit educationally sensitive just by itself. Uh, orientation to date, I mentioned with the MMSC. Uh, and so for the most bang for your buck, simply insert other good tests in between encoding and recall. So there are four components, encoding, temporal orientation, uh, verbal or semantic fluency, and acute recall. So the encoding part, I use paired associates like a uh, red ball, white horse, golden key. And the patient has to repeat them. Now, if they mess up, <clears throat> the encoding score is based on how many times you have to repeat the items before they say them correctly twice, not necessarily consecutively. So if I have to repeat once, I don't take off any points for that. I'll point out that higher scores are worse on the Q&A. So it's, it's they're kind of like negative points as well is how you can think of it. So zero is if, if I have to repeat it once, they don't take off of that. They may not have been paying attention. They didn't hear, et cetera. But if I have to repeat it again, that's one point. If they still don't get it, I have to repeat it again, that's two. And if they still don't get it after that, I'll just go one in by one and score three points. So you can get a sense uh, sometimes just from this. Anybody who scores a two or a three, on the encoding aspect is going to have problems down the line. Okay, then you ask the patient, uh, okay, what's today's date? Um, you allow, I allow one day plus or minus on the date. Uh, two, if you have the wrong month, and three off if you have the wrong year. So I consider it more of a cognitive sin not to know the month and the date, and even more so not to know the year. So I Weight it accordingly, unlike the mini metal or mocha, where it's just one point off for each of them. So you can lose up to six points on that. Okay, then it's animals in a minute. Um, and I uh, also take off a repetition. Now, when I tell the patient this, I'll like note down, you know, how many, you know, what time it is that we started exactly with the second hand and uh, so and write them down as the patient goes along. Um, so zero points is 14 or more, one point 10 to 13, animals two, seven to nine, et cetera. I also take off uh, a point uh, if they have more than one uncorrected repetition. 
and two if they have more than three of uncorrected repetitions. So this is when the patient offers up an animal as being a new, you know, animal, uh, rather than saying, you know, dog, cat, horse, cow, pig. No, I said dog, I said cat. So I don't think offer that. But if they offer up an old animal, not recognized, they said it before, that's a repetition. And Alzheimer patients tend to do that. So then finally, acute recall. What are the three things I gave you? Remember, uh, you don't give further cues like saying they have colors. So it's a zero to six, uh, zero if they get them all right, six if they don't remember any. Uh, once in a while, they may mix them up, in which case it's a half with for each item that was on the list, but um, uh, uh, incorrectly paired. And so some of the items in each section is the total Q and E score. So normal is zero to two, three is kind of borderline. So summary of the Q and E scoring, zero to three for encoding, up to six points for temporal orientation, uh, a number of points you can lose on category fluency and recall. So zero to two is normal, three is kind of borderline, over three is cognitive impairment. So I did a study some years back with a guy, Dr. Alan Trupin, a neurologist who runs a memory clinic in Spokane. And um, he uh, had his nurse uh, test patients with a Q&E and something called the Washington adaptation of the Addenbrooke's Cognitive Evaluation. So the ACE test was in England, and it's a 100-point test, and he adapted it for Washington State. For example, by asking who's the governor of Washington State rather than who's the prime minister of England. Um, and um, <clears throat> uh, you can extract out of that the mini middle state, the mini cog, the six item screener, which I mentioned briefly earlier, and a clock. Uh, Troopin, uh, Dr. Troopin did not know the QA results, he just had the ACE test available. And he made the diagnosis of normal MCI or Alzheimer's disease or other dementia on clinical grounds. So how did it work out? So we stratified patients by their mini mental state scores. Uh, and there's very mild patients we call those are people with normal mini mental states of 27 to 30. The Q and E of score four and above um, picked up uh, like 70% of them. And was statistically better than uh, the uh, the other test, uh, and Q and E was uh, you know like over ninety percent picking up. Here's a one of one or two patients that who had mild Alzheimer's with mini metals of twenty one to twenty six, um, and uh, overall uh, you know it was like eighty plus percent picking up uh, mini metals. Patients who were diagnosed with dementia with mini metals of 21 to 30. Um, uh, you'll note the clock draw here did not do all that great compared to the other tests. Um, so, a summary slide here of uh, different mental status tests time less than two minutes. Is it educationally sensitive? Is there an adequate point spread to follow the patients over time? And does it require the patients to draw or write? That can be a handicap if your patient has some motor impairment or you know, you're testing them in a hospital setting. Uh, so the mini metal, for example, uh, takes longer than two minutes. It is educationally sensitive, but it can you, you can use it to follow the patient over time. So again, uh, uh, my test is less than two minutes. Uh, the animals in a minute may have a little bit of educational sensitivity, but it shouldn't be for the other things. And it does have an adequate point spread to follow patients over time. But once patients hit moderate or severe, you can't use it. It's really just following patients over the like mild uh, course. So in summary, cognitive impairment and dementia is often undetected in the doctor's office. Patient and family may be unaware as well. You can improve your detection by using some of these screening tests. And detection has important social consequences for the family as well as the patient. 
Uh, and uh, interventions for treating cognitive impairment are available, and hopefully drugs like aducanumab or its successors have proven to be, you know, effective in earlier stages become, becomes even more imperative that you identify these patients early on. Okay, thanks very much for your attention. I'll point out my email address here again if you're interested in trying some of these tests out for yourself and you want the forms, uh, just send me an email. Thank you.